And here's our second example of how to utilize Newton's third law concepts in a problem like this. And so let's say we have a wedge-shaped object and in it we place a ball and assuming that there's no friction between the ball and the edges or the walls of this wedge-shaped object, what are the forces, the reactionary forces, F1 of this wedge pushing back this way and F2 pushing back this way? How do you do that? Well, first of all, you have to realize if there's no friction between the surface of an object and the surface of the uh, object that it's resting on, that the forces will be perpendicular to the surfaces. That's one advantage knowing that. So in this case, we know that F1 will be perpendicular to the surface here, and F2 must be perpendicular to the surface there. So that's good. We also realize that gravity is at work here, so we know that we have the force of gravity pulling this object downward, and that would be equal to mg. So, the only forces acting on this ball is the force of gravity acting this way and then the forces of the, the two sides of the wedge pushing this way and this way. So we realize now that those three forces, they must add up to zero because there's obviously no acceleration here. So we know that those forces must, must add up to zero, which means that we can sum these up graphically and they should add up to zero. If we sum them up graphically, we'll get the mg coming down this way. So this would be mg. We have the f2 in this direction. And then we have the f1 in this direction. Like so. And of course, we can go ahead and put arrows on that to represent that they are vectors indeed. Also realizing that if this angle here is 30 degrees, that means this angle right here must be 30 degrees, so that must be theta as well. Now notice that F1 is the hypotenuse of this triangle, and F2 is the opposite side to the angle. Mg is a known quantity if we know what the mass is, in this case 5 kilograms. So we should be able to figure out the magnitude of F1 and F2 using trigonometry. So since F1 is the hypotenuse, we can say that Mg is equal to the hypotenuse F, and since that's the adjacent side to the angle, times the cosine of theta. And then in this case here, we can say that uh, uh, the tangent of theta, which is by definition equal to the opposite side over the adjacent side, is equal to the magnitude of F2 divided by the magnitude of mg. So in this way, we have two equations that will give us the magnitude of F1 and F2. Now, of course, I should have said F1 right there. All right. Knowing that, we can go ahead and solve the first equation for F1. We have F1 is equal to mg divided by the cosine of theta. In this case, m is 5 kilograms. g, of course, is 9.8 meters per second squared and the cosine of 30 degrees. And that will give us the first answer, the magnitude of F1, which is 5 times 9.8 and divided by the cosine of 30 and we get 56.6 newtons. That would be for F1. And then, using this here, we can solve for F2. F2 is equal to mg times the tangent of theta, which is equal to 5 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times the tangent of 30 degrees. All right, so we have the 30, take the tangent of that, times... 9.8 times 5 equals, and we get 28.3 newtons. And there's the two answers. And of course, the way we're able to solve this problem is to realize that the weight of this ball is being pulled down to the gravity. The two contact points are right here. We know that the reactionary forces must be perpendicular to the surface. And then since those are the only three forces acting on this, we can go ahead and put those into a triangle. We know that the sum of those forces must add up to zero because there's no acceleration. And then use the relationship of the triangle to find F1 and F2. And that's how you do that problem.